welcome to the Victorian Aboriginal News Referendum 23 Tapes podcast. I'm your host, Charles Parkiner. Victorian Aboriginal News acknowledges and pays respect to traditional owners and custodians across Australia. We acknowledge the elders who have gone before, those who currently lead their communities and those who will follow in years and generations to come. Joining me today on the Referendum 23 Tapes podcast is the CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, Arnie Jill Gallagher, proud Gunda Jamara woman. Arnie Jill, thanks for joining us here on the podcast. I'm really happy to be here. Arnie Jill, let's get right into it. We're talking about the referendum and the proposed constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. Yep. Let's focus on health rather than the politics of it. Yep. Now, when it comes to closing the gap, we've got 17 key metrics. Five of those are in the health area and they're the top five mm-hmm. key metrics. How do you see and your team sees that a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament will have an impact on health outcomes for First Nations peoples right across Australia? Okay. Can I say, I believe 100% that if Aboriginal people are listened to and are in the driver's seat of coming up with solutions to a lot of the problems that our communities currently face in the health space, there will be success. Now, I can mention two projects here at Vacho. And one of them is the Koori Maternity Services Strategy. Now, 20-odd years ago, Vacho developed a strategy and it was called From Her to Maternity. And that strategy was to build up Aboriginal, at a local level, the co-op's capacity to be able to look at Koori Maternity. So when you talk about the co-ops, you're talking about all 23 of your members right across the state? Yes, very much so. The Vacho membership. So putting the decision-making or the influence back in the hands at a local level of community control. So Vacho and our members developed the KMS program and it's one of the most successful programs that you see today around, one, reducing the low birth weights that we currently have in Victoria. Still not 100%, by the way, but it is reducing So that program's been very successful. The other program that Vacho and our members, one of the biggest issues at the moment is that our people don't access preventative programs around cancer. But how how would the voice help that? The voice is about empowerment. The voice is about governments listening to this voice and the voice holding governments accountable For example, 30-odd years ago, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Who's holding governments accountable for the implementation of those recommendations? Mm. They're probably a bit outdated now. They probably need to be upgraded. But who's holding them accountable? We don't have a mechanism to hold governments and the service sector, including Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, accountable for better outcomes. Well, you mentioned low birth weights here Mm -hmm. in Victoria still being a problem. A lot of people, quite frankly, believe that the health problems with First Nations peoples don't exist within Victoria or New South Wales, but they may exist within the more rural areas such as the Northern Territory and those more remote areas. What's the reality of this, though? The reality of this for the health outcomes of Aboriginal people, say, living in Fitzroy, are the same outcomes of those people living in Fitzroy Crossing. So just that we we have different solutions, by the way. For those living in Fitzroy Crossing, would have different solutions to for us as our people living in Fitzroy. There's different solutions right across this continent. For example, when I did the original Recognise campaign, road trip, I stopped at a small remote community in the APY lands and I asked one of the Aboriginal health workers, if you had a magic wand, what would you want in this community, very remote Aboriginal community? And you know what they said to me? We want an in-ground swimming pool. (laughs) 
No, no, it's not. It's not funny. There are health benefits to that, which I didn't realise. There are health because one of the biggest problems in that remote community was lack of water. Okay, in ground swimming pool, there's a lot of spin-offs benefits, and that is no school, no pool. That's one. Second one is if you have an in-ground swimming pool, you also have to, you know, uh, have a shower before you go in. Right. So that helps with the ear, eyes and nose issues in remote communities where in Melbourne an in-ground swimming pool is not the solution. Yeah, of course. So the point that I'm making is we have the solutions People might say, though, that, well, look, why do you really need a voice, even at a local or national level, when you've already got VATCHO, which is a peak body for 23 Aboriginal health organisations and co-ops around Victoria, what value is the voice going to be and contrawise won't it actually work in conflict mm. with VATCHO? No, I don't see that at all. The voice will add humongous value and it'll add a voice at the national level. We don't have that. And a voice isn't about service provision. I see the voice saying to Vacho, well, Vacho, in Victoria, you haven't done this. Why not? What's the barrier? What's the solutions? Is it the lack of resources? Can our voice help you with that? And the voice just isn't about better outcomes in the health arena. The voice is about having proper and real recognition that we are the first people of this country and that all Australians should be proud of that. And all Australians should be able to travel overseas if they can and be proud that they have one of the oldest living cultures on the planet in their own backyard. What challenges were there? Because Vacho has come out as a yes supporter mm -hmm. for The Voice. What challenges were there within the membership of Vacho and also within the broader organisation of Vacho to achieve that? Because there's dissenting beliefs and opinions on this. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't have a great deal of challenges. Our board supported 100%. Vacho coming out and making a statement that we support a yes campaign. So it wasn't a big challenge, but the challenge is that there, there are Aboriginal people out there, not a lot, but there are Aboriginal people out there who have different points of view and they're allowed to have that, by the way. But all we've got to remember is that the last polling we did, it was something like 83% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people supports a yes vote. You can't go away from that. 83%. Yeah. So in a democratic process... The, the numbers win. That's, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, we still have some Aboriginal people who are not on board, but you know that the expectation that we have to have 100% consensus, it's ludicrous. We're never going to get that. We're never going to get it <laughs> on anything. Oh, dear. So... What are some of the other sort of non-health metrics that you believe can be supported by the voice? I think just that, you know, I mean, I don't know, I can't remember what year that Australia was declared terra nullius, but I do know it was declared by a white judge in London to actually have, and the constitution was proclaimed, what, back in 1901, by all these old white men, and that's fine. That was the society of the day back then here in this continent. And there was a debate by those white men, should we include blackfellas, Aboriginal people? Mm. And, of course, we lost out. They said no. So now it's time to action what the High Court's overturned the terra nullius. What if the no vote wins? A lot of people continually ask everyone, well, what are you going to do if you wake up the morning after and it's a no vote that's win? Does the fight continue? Do you seek for a legislated body rather than a constitutionally enshrined body? From your perspective, what does happen if there's a no vote? Because the, the fight can't stop, obviously. And the fight would never stop, hmm. by the way. But I'm confident it will be a yes vote because 
It is a modest ask, really, when you look at what the Uluru Statement is asking for. No one in this country loses anything. If anything, they gain 65,000 years of culture instead of 250. It's interesting when you're saying that no one in this country loses anything because you've been through this before when you were the Victorian Treaty Advancement Commissioner and you had to go out there across Victoria talking to non-Aboriginal communities who were really scared that they were going to lose their backyards, just like native title before that, if treaties started to eventuate. So do you see this ongoing cycle of scaremongering from the conservative media and those in opposition? Oh, can I say? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I do see it and it's very sad yeah. that the media, and I don't know whether it's all the media, Charles, I don't know, but I'm so disappointed that the media can't see the benefit of this and it's not about selling newspapers no more because we don't have newspapers, do we? <laughs> That's right. Well, I think we do, but just not as popular. Well, yeah, it's all uh, okay. on social media and Sky News <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what their fear is because every citizen of this country has everything to gain mm. by a yes vote. Every citizen. Does it frustrate you, though, that these arguments continually pop up? It frustrates me that we have people that believe it. Mm. You know, your backyard is not under threat in any way, shape or form. And, you know, when you look at what Nelson Mandela did when he got out of jail and became president of South Africa, look at what he achieved. Yeah. The same here. So people aren't going to lose I would love for my next-door neighbours to actually know about my culture and know how long we've been here, that we walk with dinosaurs. This has always been a passion of ah, yours, always, as long a, as I've known. You know, I mean, can you imagine what it would have been like pre-colonisation, you know, mm. 30,000 years ago, walking with dinosaurs on this continent? It's something that we all should be proud of. Absolutely. I want to bring it back now to to the health side of things because we did digress there a little bit. There are five key areas of health in closing the gap and one of them is the tragic suicide rate. Do you believe that the voice can help in addressing the tragedy of suicide within our First Nations communities here in Victoria and more broadly? I honestly believe the voice can help. Just the fact alone that if we are successful in a yes vote tells the rest of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities that Australia does care. That alone is such a big boost to your confidence, to your to the feeling that you're valued as a distinct culture in this country. That alone helps. I honestly believe a voice can make a big difference in all those areas. We're doing a lot of work here in Victoria around suicide prevention. And as we know, the alarming rates that the coroner released, I think it was last year he released mm. his report where it said here in Victoria alone, suicides within the Victorian Aboriginal community increased by 75%. It's increased. Increased. The Referendum Working Group and the Calma Langton Report have both come out with a model that has the local and regional voices mm. feeding up to the national voice. Mm. Now, obviously, the local and regional voices seems to be overlooked quite often by the No campaign. They simply think that the day after a successful referendum, we're going to have a national voice there. Do you believe that the local and regional voices here in Victoria could work effectively with peak organisations such as Vacho? Yes. How, how do you see that would work? I need to bring it back down to Victoria so I sure. can articulate properly so I don't waffle on and take up all your time. <laughs> but we've got the First People's Assembly here and we just went through elections, right? So they're our elected representatives. Okay. So how does Vacho feed into them? 
that's the big question. How do we ensure that they, the First Peoples Assembly, keep us accountable for better outcomes in all these areas? Mm. Right. So Now, just to clarify here, though, you're not advocating that the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria becomes the local and regional voices for the national voice, are you? They need to be at the table. Our elected representatives need to be at the table. I, I, I think I need to articulate what we did here in Victoria to explain what I think should be mirrored at the national level. What we did here in Victoria when designing the First People's Assembly, we knew we had to have reserved seats mm. for recognised traditional owner groups under the Traditional Owner Settlement Act. Right? We couldn't ignore them. And we also built in every time there's a new group that comes up and gets recognised, yep. uh, they have a reserve seat at that table. But we also knew the importance of having a general election. So other people who might not be connected to their TO group. So there needs to be an election for that also. So that's what I think should be mirrored at the Commonwealth level. Yeah. There will be reserve seats for structures in each jurisdiction. And in, in, in Victoria, it's the First People's Assembly. But I think there should be also an election that happens to elect other people who can sit around that table also. Beautiful. Yeah. So has any previous model, to your knowledge, actually, whether it's, it's ATSIC or the predecessors to ATSIC, have any of them actually embraced relationships with all the peak bodies right across Australia? In an ideal world, we should have a mechanism, say, for, for example, if we have the national voice, yep. and that might take another 12 months to design, by the way. It has to. It's got to go through legislation. It's to, for yeah, sake. and it's got to go through, you know, there's got to be conversations at local levels mm. about what their views are, and then it all feeds in. But there's got to be a mechanism how, say, for example, Victoria – how Vacho can feed up to that national voice. What are the health issues here in Victoria and what are the challenges? So they know that when they talk to governments that, hey, by the way, Victoria is saying this and our research and our data is showing this. Mm. So there's got to be a mechanism. We haven't got it down pat here. At the moment, I know the state government uh, sends really important things to the First Peoples for their inputs, but there's still not a formal mechanism for that to happen. And there should be. And eventually down the track that will happen. The fact is, though, it seems that for those people who continually hark on about, well, the voice, whether it's national and local and regional, are all going to be bureaucratically appointed, and don't you love this term, elite Aboriginal people. Oh. You've got to love that one. Have yeah. you not heard that one before? No. Oh, that's a classic. It's oh, been doing okay. the rounds for a couple really? of months. Yeah. Oh, elite. <laughs> elite Aboriginal people. So who's elite? Well, I don't know, but... Uh... You know... <laughs> Charles, I've got, and I'm not bragging here, by the way, you know, I, I've got AO after my name, so I've been, indeed, yep. I've been awarded the Order of Australia, but there's more important initials that I would love to have after my name. And they are, come on. And they are GRB. They mean a lot to me, GRB. Gunda Jamara, can I guess? No, no, oh. no, no. Grassroots Blackfella. <laughs> if only we had more GRBs out there. There's a lot of GRBs out yeah. there. A lot of them aren't in positions of influence and a lot of them are. But every Blackfella is a GRB. So you believe that we're going to get more GRBs than elite Aboriginal people in the voices? I don't think there are any elite <laughs> Aboriginal people, by the way. You know, I mean, people might, you know, and I don't want to mention names, but a well-known professor at the national level who's been a, a strong leader in the Uluru, I mean, I saw her story, I think it was on the 7.30 report a couple mm. of weeks ago, and her upbringing and... Nothing elite about that. Nothing elite about that, by yeah. the way. So, you know, I think we need to be careful about saying elite blackfellas. To me, every blackfella 
is a GRB. I couldn't agree with you more. Aunty Jill Gallagher, thank you so much indeed for coming onto the Referendum 23 tapes and we'll chat again soon, I'm sure. Thank you very much. For a full transcript of this interview, visit the Victorian Aboriginal News website at vicaboriginalnews.com.au. Until our next episode, stay safe and stay informed.